The Mayday call came in last night. Sometime around 2300 maybe. If you want anything more exact, you'll have to pull the ATC records. I was supposed to be working remotely because of this virus bullshit, but um, I guess I have bigger problems now, huh? Anyway, yeah, a commercial jet out of LaGuardia headed up to IAD. I'm enjoying my fourth cup of coffee and thinking about cutting out 15 minutes early, but it comes across the wire. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Potomatic approach. This is United 3305 declaring an emergency at this time. I keep my mic. Uh, United 3305, this is Potomatic approach. Did you, did I hear you correctly? Are you declaring an emergency? Affirmative. Requesting vectors for immediate landing. U United 3305? I said as calmly as they trained me to. State the nature of your emergency. Fuel on board and number of souls. Sir, we, uh, we have, uh, looks like two and a half hours of fuel. Approximately 102 souls on board. As far as the, um, the other thing, I, well, I, I, I don't know. The flight attendants were reporting extreme illness or something among the passengers, and, uh, the radio crackled and fell silent. I counted 30 seconds aloud and keyed my mic again. United 3305, looks like your mic is on. Say again, you have sick passengers on board. Confirm? Affirmative, came the response. I sighed and pinched the bridge of my nose between thumb and forefinger. I, I wanted to, to tell the pilot to kick sand. I mean, the last thing that we needed was a bunch of passengers with the virus landing outside of the capital, you know? But... I had a job to do, so instead I said, United 3305, what are your intentions? The pilot's voice squawked up over my headset. I don't really know. Flight crews have stopped responding to PA addresses. It's, it stinks like shit or puke or something else, and um, I, I, I could hear them screaming, sir. Well, that got me upright in my chair, I tell you. Copy that, 3305, I said. Blood pounding in my ears. Descent maintain 10,000 feet. Altometer 29.86. Proceed direct to, uh, hang on. I scrambled across my desk for another map. I scanned quickly for the nearest private airfield. Proceed directly to airfield 50 oh, miles southwest of your position for immediate landing. We will have medical and security personnel standing by the ground. Keep us posted, United 3305. There was another long silence over the line while I held my breath. Roger, the pilot said at length, his voice barely audible. This time, direct airfield. Descent maintained, 10,000 feet. I slammed my headset to my desk and bolted for the door. My call to the CDC quarantine station was transferred to a guy I was vaguely familiar with named Stradley Bumgarner, who sounded half asleep. We went over my conversation with the United pilot and about a possibility of outbreak for a virus on the plane, and he sighed. Have I ID'd the uh, index station? I told him I had no idea. Right. All right. Uh, let's get over to the airfield to meet the plane. I'll send a car for you. Me? I took my watch. I don't think I... Stradley interrupted me. I know it's late, Jim. You don't... You don't think I'd rather be home, too? You are the Director of Air Traffic Operations. We need an FAA representative on site. It's your job. Fine. I said, I'll get ready. So yeah, that's how I ended up in the back seat of a government issue sedan barreling through the countryside at 15 past midnight last night. Or this morning, I guess. Either way, Stradley was up front with a driver alternately taking calls on his cell and chain-smoking cigarettes whose butts he flicked out the window every few miles. The airfield was lit up like Christmas as we turned off the main road and trundled across an empty parking lot to the runway. A United Airbus A319 was parked on the tarmac, ringed by a dozen ambulances and remote area lighting rigs whose halogen beams threw long shadows across the ground. Real shit show, huh? Stradley mused as he rolled past a cluster of fellows in full hazmat gear hurrying towards the plane. Is this, uh, terrorists or something? I asked, leaning forward in my seat for a better view. Stradley took a few quick drags from his Pall Mall. Whatever it is, it's, uh, not good. Top brass knows something's up. That was Bob Redfield on the horn just now. The director does not just call, you feel me? We parked alongside a low-slung hangar whose doors had been rolled open and climbed out. Inside, the planes were gone, 
and they were using the space as a kind of makeshift triage center, I guess. A CDC tech, Dr. Irene Arbogast, according to the laminated badge clipped in the front of her PPE, approached us and greeted Stradley. What are we dealing with? He wanted to know as we fastened respirator masks over our faces. She shrugged, her eyes huge and wild behind a clear face shield. It's a nightmare, sir. 68 of the passengers taken off in the plane have already died. Stradley froze mid-stride. 68 people? Died from what? We don't know yet. Based on preliminary exams, we're thinking some aggressive form of, well, it, it looks like cancer to me. Cancer, said Stradley, turning to me, though the pilot said this was infectious. Let me show you something, said Dr. Abagast. She led us across the hangar to a long steel folded table where the unmistakable shape of a body lay draped beneath a white sheet. It was a man, or I guess what was left of one. Ashen, waxy features with wasted, thin limbs stared up at me. A grisly incision ran from his abdomen up to his withered breastplate. The smell of him was unbearable. This, Dr. Abagast said, is Donald Eastman, 34 years old and a resident of upstate New York. Mr. Eastman was carried off the plane half an hour ago, complaining of intense abdominal pain, vomiting, and hematuria. He died within minutes. As you can see from the skin lesions, he's just riddled with carcinoma. And look here. Lung tissue is necrotic. See the absences? He has all the signifiers of a late-stage cancer patient, only... Only what? asked Stradley, defiantly lighting another cigarette. Only, according to his wife, he wasn't a smoker, and... And when she dropped him at the airport this afternoon, well, apparently he was perfectly healthy. We looked at his driver's license. He weighed a good 220 pounds this morning. I stole a glance at the body on the slab then, and let me tell you, this guy probably wasn't tipping the scale much past a buck fifteen. You're saying he got cancer between here and New York. They all have, said Dr. Abagast. Cancer or, or something we've never seen before. Is it contagious? I asked, fidgeting nervously with my respirator. Like, should I be worried? The doctor shook her head. We don't know. Cancer isn't spread via infection. It's cellular. Sometimes it's genetic and random. Other times you'll get it from smoking or laying out in the sun. But these people, it's like they were all cooked in a giant microwave. We moved to the mouth of the hangar and watched for a little bit in silence as government officials, first responders, swarmed around the plane. Further out in a strip of flattened grass, some folks were getting a bonfire going to get rid of the body, as they said, in case of infection. I watched the first few shrouded forms get tossed in before turning away. Excuse me, docs, huffed a man in National Guard uniform sliding over. We found something on the plane. Whatever it is, tag it as evidence, said Stradley. It's a passenger, said the officer, hiding in the lavatory, uh, someone who's not sick. He didn't look like anybody special, you know, sitting handcuffed behind that beat up old desk in the back of the rental office. He looked, he looked normal. There was a plain-faced guy with a receding hairline and a second-hand suit with dark sweat stains under his pits. He smiled politely when we entered the room and instead of drumming his fingers on the faux wood desktop. Evening, boss, said Stradley, plopping down in the room's only other chair. Stradley Baumgartner with the CDC, this is Jim, of the FAA. We were here to ask you some questions before the feds roll your happy ass to jail. You okay with that? The man licked his dry lips with a mealy mouth slurp and nodded. Good. Now well, let's start with your name. Hans, he said. Hans Leiden. His voice was soft, slick. Uh, Mr. Leiden, uh, you care to explain what you were doing on that plane? He shrugged. I travel often for business. Now it was Stradley who was smiling as he shook out a fresh cigarette. Traveling for business. It's not. It's funny. You know, we uh, pulled the passenger manifest from United 3305. Uh, we took a look at it. And you, you know, wouldn't you know, uh, there's no Hans Leiden on board. No Hans Leiden and no 103rd ticketed passenger. And you're not sick. You're not out there on the barbecue pit. So I want to know. Who the fuck are you, and why were you on that flight? The man, Hans Leiden, or whatever his name was, sucked 
thoughtfully on his overlong front teeth. Now, I have a lot of names. Start with how you snuck on board, then, I said from the back of the room. Is it some kind of biological weapon? Stradley cut in. Something from China or North Korea? Is that how you did it? He laughed like he had heard something funny. Kind of dry, rattling sound. What would I need in something like that? No, these people were already dead. I just sped up the process. Christ. So you admit it. The man nodded to Stradley. Of course. What were you trying to do? He pulled his lips back in a pantomime of a smile. Eli Batuti Ima Idu Mituti. Jesus. What is that? Some kind of Arab? Jim, call those guys from Homeland Security down here, will you? I moved towards the door, but hesitated when the man called my name. What good will that do, Mr. Tolliver? The fourth seal has already been broken. Who do you work for? Stradley demanded, pushing back from the desk. The plain-faced man ignored him. It's hard he started. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with pestilence. His mouth creased the last word paternally. I can't tell you how I can't let you hold me up any longer. I've got a job to do. I quickly stepped out of the back office and called for the guys with guns. They followed me back, but... And, well, I guess you got an idea how this goes. Stradley was dead. Hemorrhaged to death right there. Might have been Ebola, but I heard. And that Hans guy, he was gone. Poof. Finished. Do the math. And me? Cancer. Yeah, it's everywhere. In my gut, in my balls. Same with everybody who was in that airfield. I thought they got more than a few hours left, honestly. That's why this is important. The government, they're going to shit the bed on this the way that they have with everything else. Cover it up. Hope it goes away. But after last night, after what I saw, <laughs> there's something much worse than a virus out there. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just want to make sure that all of you guys are still staying safe and doing your best to stay inside and keep yourself quarantined if you can do so. For those of you who can't, really appreciate you guys doing what you, you know, have to do. So, all the best to all of you who are still working, and all the best to all of you who are forced to kind of stay home and are not able to work. If you guys are missing out on a lot of the conventions, which at this point, all of them that I was planning on going to this year, with the exception of San Japan, uh, looks like have been either canceled or pushed back. If you guys were looking forward to any of the conventions this year and are missing out on a lot of the artwork from some of your favorite authors or artists, take a look in the description down below. At least until the quarantine is over, you'll be able to find links to a bunch of my artist friends as well as authors uh, in the description of every video. And of course, I will be bringing you guys stories every single day from now until the end of time, available here on YouTube as well as here on the podcast on Spotify, Apple, iTunes and Google and wherever else you can get podcasts. And now a very special thank you, big thank you, the biggest thank you I can possibly give to all of you who support on patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, who help keep the lights on in my house. Patreons such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Ken Lendo Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Chompinski, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, G. Weevil 3, Diana Krauss, Stephen Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, Nico Cow, The Ginger Bros, Dante Rao, Rafael Rodriguez, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Steampunk Center, Caleb Dougal, Daniel Paulson, Sky Harbor, The Homeless Bird 93, Gabrielle Undefined, Barbie Carmen, Liam Newman, Aaron Stormcrow, Dr. Strawberry, Barbara Masio, Thomas Burgett, Azazel Rotten, Let's Get Scared, S-Man, Brandy Hasanori, and King DDD. Thank you guys so much for supporting on Patreon, as well as all of you that are shown in the description down below. And sweet dreams, everyone. <laughs>